Thank you. So uh, my name's Sean Simpson. I'm from a company called Lenzatech. So I'm going to start off today's talk with a number, 85 million. 85 million is the number of barrels of oil that this world consumes every day. As you've just heard, we're in the business of making uh, fuel, so that will tell you that the, there's no real market risk. Yeah? <laughs> um, so and the majority of, the, of that oil that we consume is used for fuel. Um, and we know that the demand for, for oil is going up. It'll go up by 40% over the coming 20 years. Over that same time period, the population of Earth will go from around 7 billion people today to around 8 billion at, uh, at a conservative estimate. We also know, we all know, that the, combustion, the refining and the combustion of oil uh, leads to the release of CO2. That is, CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere and it's accumulating at a rate uh, that's having a, a pretty severe uh, environmental, uh, economic, and human health uh, implication around the world. So we know we're, 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 we're consuming oil, we know we're burning it, we know that the, the, the gases being released from it are, are slowly uh, uh, poisoning us. So, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> so, and we know also that the only alternative, the only way that we can produce fuels today that don't release CO2 uh, at, at the same rate as burning oil, require the use of foodstuff. The only mature technologies that we have today for producing fuels rely on the consumption of corn or sugarcane to produce an alcohol that we can use to, to mix with, with gasoline. So, the population's going up, uh, more mouths to feed, CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere, and the only way to stop it is to start using food for something other than eating. Uh, it's not so good. So, <laughs> so we know that, uh, that we need uh, technologies that will allow us to produce uh, fuels from new resources, resources that uh, don't impact the availability of food or the availability of land to produce food. And, and really, that's where we started with Landsatech. We started at a position where we were looking at resources, thinking about resources. What's the ideal resource from which to make a sustainable fuel. Um, we're scientists, biologists, so uh, we didn't really have a gut feel for this. We came up with a list. And our list went something like this. It had to be a resource that was available. The problem was here today. And uh, so it had to be available today, yeah? Um, we needed a, a resource. We needed stuff that was here in very high volume. Yeah? We're not talking uh, about making uh, boutique jewelry. We're talking about making fuels. So we need something that's available in extremely large volume. We need something that was available in a single location. Transport costs, uh, for example, in agriculture and other industries are incredibly, uh, have a very uh, major impact on the financial viability of, uh, of, of, of using various resources. And therefore, it's, it would be ideal if the resource that we wanted to access was available in a single location. We didn't have to drive it around anywhere. Um, low value. I mentioned I'm a biologist. Even a biologist gets that if you've got a technology that's turning gold into silver, it's not such a great idea. It's not going to fly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and it should be non-food, as I mentioned. There's going to be the, the demand for food is, is, uh, is really dr driven by uh, hungry mouths and not vehicles. So that was our list of resources. And what we found we were describing, basically, were, were waste resources. Uh, industrial off-gases, municipal solid waste, residues from, from agriculture. And, uh, and each of these um, resources either existed as a gas today or could be readily converted into a gas, a gas containing carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And therefore, what we were looking to do was, was identify a technology, develop a technology that could convert gases into fuels. And, and it was that basis that, uh, that drove us towards this technology, drove us towards gas fermentation. We have developed a technology, uh, it's a, uh, a bacterial process, a microbial process, uh, that converts gases into fuels. The way to think about it is it's like fermentation, it's like brewing. We're talking about putting a brewery at a steel mill, basically, um, that, uh, that allows us to convert all of these different resources into uh, uh, a product, an alcohol, that we can blend with gasoline and displace oil, uh, dis displace gasoline and therefore reduce our reliance on, on oil. The company today, we started this in 2005. In 2005, we had a piece of paper with an idea on. Um, 
Today, we uh, employ around 140 staff. We've raised around $100 million in venture capital, uh, mostly from uh, the US, but also out of China and Malaysia. We, our staff cover a whole range of disciplines, from engineering to uh, uh, microbiology, chemistry, etc. Uh, we have a very aggressive attitude towards uh, patent protection, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, our CEO is a lady called uh, Dr. Jennifer Holmgren. She came to us out of a company called UOP, which are a technology provider to the oil industry. Uh, so she was a director at that, at that company. So as I mentioned, our technology allows the conversion of a whole bunch of different resources into fuel. Diverse array of resources, each of which is available somewhere in the world. Um, and our company is looking to convert these resources into a fuel, I've mentioned ethanol, but also a bunch of chemicals. Uh, the reason to target chemicals are, are basically twofold. One, chemicals are generally more valuable than fuels. Secondly, we're very interested in the idea of carbon capture and utilization. Can you capture carbon, sequester it into a plastic, and that plastic therefore becomes a carbon sink uh, rather than a source of, of, uh, uh, of fossil CO2 emissions? The, te the, company is, uh, a pl the company's technology platform is basically described in the center here. Not only do we focus on the microbiology of converting fuels into, uh, sorry, in converting gases into uh, fuels and chemicals, we also focus on the engineering, the process control, and the process chemistries that allow this array of different resources to be converted into an array of different uh, fuel or chemical molecules. We started with a, with a, we literally started with a test tube. We got this uh, bacteria in uh, to the lab in, in 2005. We had it in a test tube. We got our first little bit of data uh, showing that we could put some gas in that, that test tube and the micro would weave its magic and, and convert that gas into a fuel. We then started working in the, uh, in the lab in small reactors and slowly uh, we started uh, developing our technology um, in terms of uh, uh, the production of fuels at larger and larger scales. Today, we have a, a couple of different uh, uh, plants in China uh, with reactors that look like this. They stand about 20 meters tall, and uh, they're attached to steel mills, continuously producing fuel from the gases that come out of, uh, of that steel mill. So we followed a, a strict path to scale, and this really reflects the, the intersection, if you like, of biology and engineering. The biologists were able to, to show the microbe could do, do its thing, but they didn't show that it could do its thing in a way that made any commercial sense. The engineers came along and said, right, if we stick this into a vessel that, uh, that could actually work in the real world, then uh, we might have something here. So that's <laughs> fundamentally how it worked. We, get, we, de we had to develop a business case. Uh, again, you, you have a collection of scientists, and then you know, you're sitting there thinking, what does a business case look like? We really didn't know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> We got people in that did know, and they were able to, to produce uh, fantastic charts like this that basically said, look, you know, today the gases produced at a steel mill, for example, are used to make power, and uh, this is how much money they make out of their power, and if you turn that same gas into fuel, you could, you know, you could offer that they could make about twice as much money. Sounds pretty good. Uh, so we went for that. We can also show that using these gases, um, we can offer the production of a fuel that results in lower CO2 emission. So you use steel mill gases for the production of, uh, uh, of ethanol. You can then uh, offer the production of a fuel that releases 70% less CO2 than gasoline that's made from, uh, from oil. So there we are. We have a technology. It seems to work. We have a business case. And, uh, and we can prove to everybody that we're saving the environment. Where do we go to commercialize this? We had to focus on China. We had to focus on China because today, 50% of the world's steel is made in China. So we have a process that's focused on the steel industry. You go where the steel mills are. It turns out to be China. You get on a plane to Shanghai pretty fast. Um, and China's all about eating interesting food, uh, drinking a lot, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and cutting deals. You know, China's all about building relationships. The interesting food and the booze is all about the relationships. And uh, it's quite interesting. You, know, you go to, you go to uh, the States, and you're cutting a deal in the States, and you'll find that what you end up at the end of the day is a big, solid wedge of documents that you spend three hours signing. You've got to cut a deal in China, same size deal, and you end up with three pieces of paper, 
Oh, you might sign one of them, you might not. But, <laughs> but that's your deal. <laughs> but your, your relationship is really what you've built over time uh, across the table, eating interesting food and, uh, and drinking heavily. <laughs> <laughs> So far, we have uh, two joint ventures in China, one with a company called Bao Steel, one with a company called Shaogang. Um, Bao Steel are the second largest steel maker in China based out of Shanghai. Shaogang are around the fourth largest uh, based out of um, uh, Beijing. Uh, each of the, at each of these places, we have what we call a pre-commercial demonstration plant. So at each uh, of their steel mills, we have a facility, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, that can produce around 400,000 liters of fuel a year. Uh, the, the, the facility looks like this. This is not a commercial facility. This is a facility allowing uh, the steel mills to kind of dip their toe in the water, understand a little about the technology, uh, understand how it works, and understand how it will integrate with their steel making process. Uh, basically, this is the bullshit test. Um, and uh, this is the reactor here. It stands about 20 meters tall. Uh, the gas, I guess, where you're all sitting, there's a big steel mill, yeah? And uh, the gas comes to the facility, it's processed over here, it goes through our reactors in which we produce alcohol, the alcohol is separated here, we treat our, all our water and that's returned, uh, and then the, the finished product comes out and we can sell that into the marketplace. We also have developed a technology to allow us to produce an aviation fuel from that alcohol. So, why did we get into aviation fuel? We got into aviation fuel because when you look at the fuel uh, market, you realize that um, you know, electric cars are coming, that the, 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 there's a big dynamic shift in, in how, uh, how we use fuels and how we think about fuels. But that's true in, in, in land transport. It's not true in the air. Yeah? I mean, I'm not going to get into an electrically powered plane. You can. I'm not. <laughs> um, so. So we got into to aviation fuel. We can offer uh, low-carbon aviation fuel that we produce from, uh, uh, from, our, uh, from our process. And, uh, and that, in turn, allowed us to, to put up this slide. We only put up this slide because it proves that I've met Richard Branson. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we're the only company that's taken him to a steel mill and a pub in the same day. <laughs> uh, and we've, we've got a deal with, uh, with Virgin Atlantic to supply them with fuel uh, when we produce it in large enough quantities in China. Uh, and that's a, a low-carbon fuel right now. The, there are pretty strict taxes around uh, aviation um, emissions in, in Europe. We've, we've started looking at, uh, at chemicals. We, we're getting very serious about the production of chemicals from the same process, so the same infrastructure that takes gas from a steel mill into ethanol can also be used to take gas from a steel mill into a chemical. This is a chemical, it doesn't really matter what it's called, all these, all these diagrams are very confusing, but um, it basically is the chemical that's used to make nylon, so we can make nylon. So the idea would be that in future we'd be able to capture carbon in nylon. Uh, so you'd have a sort of carbon sequestering jumper, I guess, <laughs> or a pair of trousers. Um, so <laughs> uh, I don't know, what, what's, 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 what's the nylon made into these days? Um, um, so yeah, at the end of the day, we're producing a bunch of fuels. We're, we're looking to be producing a, a bunch of chemicals. Each of the products that we're looking to make uh, are, uh, um, represent very, very big global markets. Um, we've always... I guess, thought about technology in terms of trying to supply into the biggest market we can find, and, and fuel is the, the biggest market we find. There's no market risk. The only risk is technology. And, and from an investor perspective, that's really reassuring. If you had to kind of assure them about your technology and about your ability to create a market, that, uh, that would be a, a pretty tall ask. I mentioned that we're very aggressive with, with painting. This is something I really want to emphasize here, because I think in New Zealand, it's something that we don't do well. Um, when we entered the area of gas fermentation, there were five patents in our, in our space. We, as a company, have filed 179 patents since we, since we founded. 30 of our patents have now issued. Um, and it allows us to give our investors this kind of hit-by-a-bus insurance. Yeah? So what happens if I'm hit by a bus, or the whole team's hit by a bus? What happens is the company's still, uh, or the company's technology is still entirely protected, and the investment, the investors' uh, investment, is protected because we've managed to protect uh, our technology very, very effectively. We file globally with all our patents, thinking about all the markets where we believe uh, we can commercialise uh, our process. 
We form relationships globally. Uh, we have relationships uh, both in terms of feedstock holders, so people who have gases that we can process, and in terms of, um, and in terms of people who would take our products, like chemical companies, etc. We've, we've encouraged a lot of people to say nice things about us. Um, <laughs> now, this is really important. I mean, we come out of New Zealand as a, as a, as a fuel production company. I mean, this is, this is not, we're not exactly following a, a trail that's been blazed for us by others here. So we have to uh, find some way of, I guess, standing on, on, on the highest shoulders we can. And sometimes the best way to do that is get to other people to say nice things about you so that when you walk in the room, people have a sense of who you are and have a sense that, uh, uh, that you should be taken seriously. Innovation, we believe, is, 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 the, is going to be the, uh, the key to solving the current climate crisis. And there really is a current climate crisis. I say that because recently, I don't know if, if you saw the, the levels of atmospheric CO2 passed 400 parts per million. At 450 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, we believe, it is believed, that there will be severe human health impacts and that could happen in the next 15 years. So it's, it's, really, it's really a crisis. I also think innovation is the key to, to, to I guess, changing uh, graphs that look like this. This is a, 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 a table that comes from a New Zealand Institute uh, report done in 2009. Uh, it's a discussion paper, and it compares New Zealand um, with Denmark. We're both countries uh, that have a pretty successful agricultural sector, um, we have both have similar sorts of population. Um, but Denmark, in addition to, to its successful agricultural sec uh, sector, derives a huge amount of per capita GDP from manufacturing. And that's something that, that we need to look at closely and ask ourselves, why, why, you know, why isn't that graph reversed? Why, aren't we, uh, why don't we have a, a much larger manufacturing sector, or at least we're deriving... Um, uh, uh, larger uh, GDP from, uh, from sectors outside uh, of agriculture. And I think that innovation is something that we need to encourage much more strongly in New Zealand. You know, there's a saying, um, I guess, vision without execution is hallucination. And <laughs> yeah, so um, in innovation without commercialization is also, you know, hallucination to a degree. It's, uh, and, I, and I think we're great at innovating, but we're not great at, at commercializing those, those innovations. And, and I think that's something that we need to uh, address, recognize, address, and, uh, and change. For my part, I'm uh, associated with a group called the Ice House. Uh, it's, a, it's a group based here in New Zealand. Uh, sorry, in New Zealand. Here in <laughs> Auckland. Um, and, uh, and the Ice House uh, uh, are somewhat well known for being an incubator uh, for, for startups, but they're, they're so much more than that. They also, 90% uh, of their, their, their customers come from uh, small to medium sized uh, enterprises. Uh, they've developed a whole suite of, of tools uh, and networks, expertise, uh, uh, funding strategies to help businesses realize their full potential, I guess. Uh, and I'm very excited to be, uh, to be associated with this group. They, in turn, have, uh, uh, have pioneered the establishment of uh, 3000.org. This is a group that's uh, looking to ensure that 3,000 new businesses, successful new businesses, are founded in New Zealand uh, and grow over the coming uh, years. In conclusion, uh, I'm right on time. Uh, in conclusion, um, Landsatech is, is, is a, a company, we're not successful yet, we haven't commercialized yet, that's our next, that's our next challenge, we're looking to do that uh, in the coming couple of years. Our technology is based on allowing industry, a large industry, to exist uh, uh, um, uh, and, and grow in the context of energy security concerns and uh, increasing energy efficiency concerns whilst allowing land resources and food resources to be left alone to feed growing global populations. Thank you.